good afternoon everyone uh, today i wish to welcome you all for the symposium organized by the uh, expert committee on communicable diseases of the slma and the media committee of the slma on measles uh, outbreaks we recently had in sri lanka uh, therefore we uh, thought of organizing this symposium to uh, educate the doctors and media and the public regarding this uh, situation so you all know that during the past uh, few months we had two incidents one is there were several uh, measles cases were reported from uh, few areas in colombo and there were cases the patients were admitted to uh, the lrh at the same time after few uh, weeks or one it's about one month later there were few cases uh, of measles were uh, reported from baunia prison so the regarding this matter uh, the expert committee on communicable diseases discussed about it and we thought that it is very important to uh, organize this symposium uh, on uh, measles the title of the today's symposium is, is recently reported measles cases in sri lanka lessons to be learned so we have invited three eminent speakers one is dr janaki abenaik consultant medical virologist and head of the department of uh, virology at the medical research institute uh, then dr manjula karyavasam from the epidemiology unit of the ministry of health sri lanka and Uh, dr b j c pereira a very senior pediatrician in colombo so the, they are the three speakers today uh, uh, going to express their views uh, at this symposium so the first speaker is dr uh, janaki abenaik uh she will join this symposium through zoom and uh, she will speak to us on virology and laboratory diagnosis of measles so i kindly invite dr uh, janaki abenaik to uh, start her presentation and at the same time uh, i invite dr uh, kalyani guruge Uh, to chair this symposium and the discussion later on uh, since dr kalyani guruge has to uh, sorry since dr janaki abenaik has to go for a meeting she won't be joining us uh, at the discussion so if you have any uh, questions you can ask from her after the after her uh, presentation uh but other two speakers we will have the uh, discussion at the end of the uh, pres three presentations thank you very much i kindly invite dr uh, uh, abenaika to uh, uh, do the presentation so in the next 20 minutes i'll be uh, talking on virology of the measles virus and the laboratory diagnosis of measles virus infection right so okay so this is the overview of the today's talk first measles virus infection and the measles virus virology and then laboratory diagnosis of measles virus infection and the challenges facing during laboratory diagnosis and reporting so measles is highly infectious and vaccine preventable disease so the transmission can occur through respiratory droplets and aerosols that means actually coughing sneezing and direct contact 
which secretions can spread the disease. The incubation period is 7 to 21 days and infected individuals are infectious before and after 4 days of symptoms onset. So then the clinical spectrum uh, varies from mild febrile rash to severe pneumonia, encephalitis and even to death. So who are the highest risk of highest risk groups of acquiring measles infection? So unvaccinated children or adults and also incompletely vaccinated children or adults. When they have exposure to known measles individuals or recent travel to areas with active measles transmission, so they can acquire the measles infection easily. And then, so who are the highest risk groups of severe measles infection or complications of measles? So uh, infants and children aged less than five years, and then pregnant women, and also immunocompromised people like cancer, and also people who are taking uh, chemotherapy and also individuals with HIV infection. So these groups also are at higher risk of severe measles infection. Okay, with that, uh, now uh, I will move on to the measles virus virology. So this is an enveloped RNA virus belonging to the paramyxoviridae family. It is a monotypic virus. So hemagglutin in H protein. So here you can see hemagglutin in H proteins. And fusion F proteins, so fusion F proteins uh, are the major targets for development of neutralizing antibodies. And neutralizing antibodies directed against the H proteins. So here H proteins are confer, confirm the lifelong immunity actually. So then the H protein again acts as the receptor binding protein and it acts as we it, and it interacts with the F protein and mediates virus attachment and host cell entry also. So F protein then facilitate the cell to cell spread of the virus. This little bit of actually related to the pathogenesis. And then uh, again, uh, virus is actually inactivated by lipid solvent and also with heat. So while measles virus is uh, divided into eight clades and uh, it, it contain actually 24 genotypes. So clades are named actually A, B, C, D, F, G, H, eight clades. And all vaccine strains are into uh, included into this genotype A. So this is how the measles vaccine was introduced into the world. So um, in 1954, doctors Thomas and Enders were able to isolate the measles virus from a 13-year-old David Edmonston blood. And in 1963, this Enders used the this Edmondson B strain to develop a measles vaccine, which was licensed in the United States since 1963. And then in 1971, measles was combined with mumps and rubella as a trivalent vaccine, as a MMR. And then vaccine, this vaccine was licensed in USA in 1971. So that is a little bit of the birth of the measles vaccine. And then, uh, so... Regarding the measles genotypes, so I was telling 24 genotypes are identified and since 1990, 19 genotypes are circulated in the world. But with time, some genotypes are disappeared and only some of them were circulated during this given period. That is since 2008 to 2018, we can see actually uh, number of actually genotypes again, but with time again, uh, in the latter part of this period, that is 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. So uh, we can see only B3, B4 genotype, B8, and also H1. Majority of them are the uh, circulating genotypes when it comes to this 2017-18. And the other genotypes that were circulated 2018 itself, so they have gradually disappeared. So this table shows the genotype distribution in the Southeast Asia re region between 2008 to 2018. Again, this uh, is very much similar to the global dis uh, distributed uh, genotype. So now we can see again B3 is there and then the D4, D8 genotype is there and D9 and also H1 is also there. So, uh, so this is similar to the global situation and in Sri Lanka also it is reported during this period D8, B3 and also H1. So this map shows the global distribution of the genotypes among different uh, regions in 2018 and 2019 and the predominant genotypes are D8. So this blue colored dots are 
actually indicating this uh, D8 genotype across the uh, world. So in Sri Lanka, genotype circulated in 2017 was D8 here. You can see in this little box. And then in 2018, it was actually genotype H1. So what happened actually? However, unfortunately, we experienced outbreak situation in March 2019. And we detected quite a number of cases. Uh, some of them we did actually gene sequencing and phylogenetic analysis. It determined that the circulated measles virus genotype was D8 during that outbreak situation. So this is the actually phylogenetic uh, tree uh, after uh, doing the phylogenetic analysis. And these are the some of the cases we sequenced. We sequenced and determined as genotype D8 during that outbreak situation in 2019. So if I can remember correctly, so this is the period actually that we are just before the getting the um, elimination certification. So uh, we published that outbreak investigation from Journal of Clinical Virology in 2020. So coming to the recent situation of genotypes, so that is genotype circulation between 2020 to uh, 2023. We can see only two genotypes are circulating around the world and out of that also D8 is the predominant genotype when it comes to the uh, year 2023. So these blue bars are the genotype uh, D8. So that is majority of the predominant genotype when it comes to the 2023. So it is D8. So anyhow, so now, right now, actually, we have only two genotypes are circulating across the world. So with that, actually, I'll move on to the laboratory diagnosis of measles virus infection. So specific diagnosis needs specific laboratory tests, yes. But still, however, there is some challenges, uh, challenges even for the laboratory diagnosis, specific diagnostic testing. So what are these actually? So number one, patient can be highly symptomatic, but have an extremely low viral load or no immune response. So this will be a challenge. And then diagnostic methods differ as per the patient presentation. Yes. And then individual variability in immune responses. Yes, that is obvious. And also sample type and the method of testing could affect test performance. That means actually serology will affect initial window period and also sometimes specimen types are not validated to each test methodology. So these are actually some of the challenges that we can we are actually coming, uh, we are facing during our uh, laboratory testing. So however, test methods we can use for the diagnosis of measles infection, right? Are the detection of measles virus RNA by reverse transcript test polymerase chain reaction, that is RT-PCR. And then the detection of, uh, that is actually uh, molecular testing. And then the second one is detection of measles virus specific IgM antibody uh, by an enzyme immunoassay. That is again serology. And then also detection of four-fold increase in measles IgG antibody using paired serum. That is from uh, acute uh, phase serum and also the convalescent phase serum. So again, the testing methodology is enzyme immunoassay. So we have to collect the blood sample. Uh, 10 days apart from the acute as an acute sample and then also the conversion sample. So then the other methodology is the uh, virus isolation in a cell culture. So those are the test methodologies that we can apply for uh, detecting of the measles virus. Okay, now um, let's see how we can apply these test methods with viral kinetics in the diagnosis of measles virus infection. This picture very clearly shows the typical viral, uh, this actually graph very clearly um, shows the typical viral kinetics and the antibody response, antibody response of an infection. So what is viral kinetics? Change of virus over time after an infection and host dynamic and also effects of therapy and disease progression. So all these actually depict from the this viral kinetics graph. So, and at the same time, it demonstrates the viral load or viral clearance over time and also the immune response. So, then again, you can see, see the viral load. So, in the early phase, so viral load is getting increases and with time, actually, it is uh, coming down and then gradually disappears. By the time, actually, we can see immune response is coming out. That is, so uh, we can detect in the late phase. Uh, 
immune responses that is IgM and IgG markers. This also assess the interpret. Uh, this also an, this, this actually assess the interpret assess and interpret the infectivity and the individual uh, of an individual and the duration of infection. So how actually we can assess the infectivity with the viral load because we can see with this graph the viral load is coming down. So then the infectivity and the infectiousness definitely we can assess with this viral kinetic pictures. So we should understand and correlate the test method and the sample type that we should collect according to the patient presentation. So that is the important thing with understanding of this viral kinetics. Okay, so what are the samples that we could collect from a suspected measles patient? So as I said, we should understand the timing of patient presentation. If it is early stage of presentation, molecular testing, so molecular testing we can do, that is actually we have to go for RNA detection, so this early phase. Um, if early stage of presentation, molecular test for detection of viral RNA, therefore we should collect nasal or throat swab or nasopharyngeal swab. So if the patient presentation is first five days of infection, then definitely we have to go for testing for viral RNA with a nasal throat swab or nasopharyngeal swab. So, if it is the late presentation, that is after fifth day of rash onset, then we can collect a blood sample for serological diagnosis. That means we can go for checking for immune responses, that is immune markers, IgM or IgG, that is after day five with a blood sample. So, however, sample has to be transported as early as possible to the testing laboratory. And if for molecular testing, whole chain has to be maintained very thoroughly. So I think uh, it is very important. And then in addition, there is a guidance from WHO for sample collection and testing methods. Number one, for countries that have been verified as measles eliminated or near elimination or re-established transmission, every case should have a fraud swab or nasopharyngeal swab and also serum samples. That means we have to take a throat swab for PCR, that is virology detection. That means actually we have to identify the genotype later on. And then the this is as a serum for diagnosis as the measles. So that is for the uh, measles uh, verified as a eliminated, all those three criteria which I mentioned. And then the other one is the WHO guidance is the for countries that are still endemic. So they are main. Main one is actually serology testing. So serology remains the gold standard, but virology should perform to identify the genotype. So it is not mandatory to go for the genotyping testing. That is that means actually PCR and RNA testing, but still you have to get the idea of what is the genotype circulating in that particular locality. So therefore, they have to do for a kind of a percentage with the RNA testing. Otherwise, they are main. Main recommendation is for in the endemic country, it is for a serology. Okay, detection of viral RNA by PCR. So, uh, sample should be nasal throat swab or nasopharyngeal swab, as I mentioned. This detects viral RNA by amplifying using primers targeting to the conserved region of the genome. And it requires, this methodology actually requires extraction of nucleic acid and then combine with amplification as the next step. So this uh, measles detection PCR is usually actually what we are using is a qualitative PCR assay. And however, we are using two different PCR assays. One is actually first PCR is a screening PCR. That is a real time PCR PCR that is we are using for screening, screening of the population. And then the second PCR is a conventional PCR, which is leading to detection of genotype. So two different PCRs we have to do. Once the uh, screening PCR positive, we have to go for the genotype in PCR just to lead for the sequencing. So anyway, now we know about, now everybody know about the PCR, right? So I don't know how to tell. It is highly specific, sensitive and rapid. However, so we can have false negative results also due to the inhibitors and also inappropriate sample collection. Maybe timing is not correct. Maybe container is not correct. So all these things actually matter and finally, we can have a false negative result also. So that means actually if the garbage come in, garbage go out. 
All right. So, uh, okay. Serological diagnosis. Uh, here we can use two markers. Uh, however, WHO recommended and preferred marker is IgM detection. IgM detection from a blood sample collected between day 3 to day 28 after onset of rash. So, this is the period that we have to take. And even now, what I understood when the, during this outbreak, even day 3 is not that good. So, if you wait for until day 5, it is better. So, if you go for day 5 to day 28, so that would be better if you are testing with the IgM because we have to we, we have to allow to immune response to uh, immune responses to build up just to detect from a, our diagnostic laboratory test kits through a laboratory test kit. Otherwise, actually, it will be negative, false negatives, definitely, and then we will be misleading. Definitely. So, because of that, actually, we have to, timing is very important when we are collecting the samples. Okay. So, this uh, test methodology is again enzyme immunoassay. So, this is a ELISA assay and then uh, we can interpret the results after taking. So, not only that, actually, uh, so we can go for the uh, IgG marker also, uh, IgG marker also, but the problem is here, we have to take two samples, one is in the acute acute phase and then the other one is the convalescent phase. So, it is very difficult and it is challenging to take a second sample. So, without these two samples, we can't interpret because we are looking here for so called rising of IgG marker. So, if we don't get the second sample, so it is uh, useless actually. So, we can't actually interpret anything. So, and also this getting the second sample is challenging. I think uh, epidemiology people will discuss that how it is difficult. Anyway, this is not encouraging by the WHO as a primary test also. So, then actually we have to focus for detecting it of IgM. All right. So, all right. So, this is the measles rubella testing algorithm. So, I don't know whether everybody can see this very clearly. So anyway, so this is the measles rubella testing algorithm recommended by the WHO to uh, measles eliminated countries. And this is the uh, algorithm actually what we are following for routine testing during outbreak free period. So this is very complicated. I'm not going to go for in deep here. Right. So, but actually, so this is the algorithm recommended because why I was telling it is complicated. We have to go for several tests for one sample. That is how actually we have to tell finally, okay, negative or positive. So, principle of this algorithm, if I tell, so this is principle. So, being a measles rubella eliminated country, we need to use parallel testing. That means both measles and rubella, we have to test from a suspected fever ash case. So, as a parallel testing, that means actually from one sample, if we get, we have to go for both rubella IgM and also measles IgM one go. So then that is actually mean by the parallel testing. So this is recommended for the eliminated measles rubella eliminated countries. And other part actually, uh, uh, other algorithm I am not going to discuss here. All right. So... Okay, very briefly, situation of the National Reference Laboratory at MRI. So, it is a WHO accredited laboratory and working uh, as a partner of Global Measles Elimination Program. To maintain the accreditation, we need to follow all the quality assurance programs, um, programs and sense procedures, testing methods, and all the uh, timelines introduced by the global program. So, laboratory needs to participate professional testing panel that is global EQA program also just to uh, maintain our standards. In addition, annually or oh, once in two years, uh, WHO expert team visited to the laboratory for inspection and they granted the accreditation to the laboratory if the performance are satisfactory to maintain as the accredited lab in a measles rubella eliminated country. That is how actually we are doing our testing. So, our laboratory is accredited by the WHO and they allow us to testing for measles rubella in a, as an eliminated country. 
All right. So with that, uh, I'm telling in Sri Lanka, we have a strong surveillance program to detect measles virus. I'm not going to go in deep all that also. As a result of that, we detected the positive case. And that was a 10 month old child, 10 days after receiving a measles mumps MMR vaccine. So this is very interesting. That is why I'm telling here. Fortunately, lab received the subsamples and did the PCR sequencing and phylogenetic analysis. Interestingly, it revealed as the genotype A, which was very much compatible with this MMR vaccination history. So you can see here, this is the phylogenetic tree after analyzing of this uh, sequences of this sample. Uh, this sample is sitting very much closer to very much closer to the genotype A, that is genotype A, Edmunds, Edmundston strain, that is the vaccine strain. So this was very exciting to us and actually we did a small publication on that also. All right, so, okay, National Reference Lab, so regarding the uh, current outbreak, I think uh, the next speaker will talk about that, but I'm not going to actually talk about that much regarding the virology part I'm talking. National Reference Lab received subsamples from the current outbreak and we did PCR, gene sequencing and phylogenetic analysis. This is the phylogenetic tree, right? This is the phylogenetic tree actually. Uh, and you can see all the samples reveal that these are measles virus genotype. So these are some of the samples we actually did analysis uh, and phylogenetic analysis after doing the sequencing. So you can see all are DA. So up to now, I think we did uh, 42 like samples. We understand all the some all the samples cases are measles genotype DA. And further, uh, we blast these gene sequences with the gene bank sequences to identify the link of these viruses. So we should understand whether they are actually circulating in our country, right, or whether they are imported. So that is why we did this. Uh, we this this. We did the blasting of the our sequences and we identified the link of these viruses. So here it was noted two different links to our samples, two different links actually. One is uh, from Victoria, Australia and the one is actually Ahmedabad, India. So two different and majority of the samples again actually linked to the Victoria, Australia. And then the few, very few, I think uh, out of 42, only two samples actually linked to the India, uh, Indian link. So this is again actually for the interesting of the audience. Okay, uh, finally, uh, what are the laboratory challenges for accurate and timely reporting? So throughout uh, in my presentation, I was telling this sample could be a challenge. So sample could be a challenge, yes. If it didn't take in the correct, uh, if, if it is not the correct sample, not the correct timing, or if also when we are actually doing in the laboratory, so if it is inadequate, that will be also a challenge and proper tra transportation and also a proper request also. Sometimes actually we get the request form without anything, even, to, even the institution was not there. So sometimes actually very pathetic. We are actually wasting our reagents because we can't even report so sometimes so these are the challenges and also we have uh, not only the sample we have the testing challenges also right sometimes actually inhibition is there and sometimes even the equipment problems are there so we actually can't meet the uh, uh, can't actually uh, reporting the results as we expected so uh, challenges are there so however Oh my God. So this is, you can't see, sorry about this. Uh, to minimize this actually, we prepared uh, sample send out guidelines through a ministry circular. And if someone is sending samples, please follow that guideline and send the sample for testing to minimize the laboratory challenges and also for accurate timely reporting. Sorry about this actually. This is the guideline, I think, from the epidemiology unit um, through with the Ministry of Health. Actually, we prepared that circular and almost it was actually circulated so uh, i'm sorry about actually it is not here i don't know what happened um uh, anyway um with that i think i will stop my presentation thank you very much for your attention since as dr ranjit said uh, i have to leave for another meeting so if there is some question i'm happy to take few questions also
Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr. Janaki Abhinayaka. That was a very clear presentation. I think we have Thank to thank you. you for that. That's a very clear presentation. Are there any questions? In this outbreak, about how many samples have been now confirmed, Janaki? Uh, so actually, uh, I'm not sure whether it is good to tell. Actually, I think we have um, gone beyond 200. Thank you. Reaching 300, actually, Madam, I think. I think we should not hide it. No, we, yeah. I mean, so actually, on top of my mind, yeah. I can't tell because 250 exceeds, I, I'm sure. So yeah. beyond, yeah. Because sometimes same sample may be coming as antibody and... Uh, Antigen also, no? Like not antigen. Uh, PCR, PCR and also, PCR yeah. But actually, as the cases, not the samples, we are actually talking uh, We uh, as the cases. Because some, um, I, yes, as you said, so from a one patient, we are getting both the swab and the, the uh, blood, sample. blood sample. But the thing is actually, so that is why I stress actually, please don't send the sample in inappropriate timing, right? So in that case, actually, we can close this outbreak also because we, I, I, I was actually telling this uh, because I, when I was tell, doing this blood sample testing, almost all the blood samples are negative. I am wasting my reagents, right? And then, so fortunately, luckily, I am getting the subsamples also some of those uh, in, uh, cases, right? So then all the cases are positive. So then our data also actually we have to manipulate a lot. And also, so if I don't do it, if... Unfortunately, we don't get the subsample, we can even close the outbreak. So because of that, the responsible people who are advising, who are educating people, please send the blood sample in the proper timing, collect the proper in a proper time. And also what I said, that well, even day three, WHO has recommended day three to day 28. But with my experience, I'm telling even day five is the best. Sometimes actually we can't catch even day three. So if you are sending a blood sample, yes, please. Now, because actually swab sample is and PCR and it is a long lengthy procedure, we have to go for two PCR. So I think now we know actually our links and also what is the circulating genotype. So because of that, actually, just to understand whether the outbreak is still continuing, we can go only with the uh, IgM, IgM in the sense serology. So please take the blood sample in the proper with the proper timing. Thank you. Thank you. Why, why do you think the samples were negative? Is it true? That is on day one or two they have done. Is it? Yes. So samples actually collecting, right? So most of the samples they're collecting. So that is also a practical problem. I understand that. When they see the patient first time, right? First contact the patient, they are collecting the blood sample. Because mm -hmm. sometimes they might think, okay, we can't catch this patient again. But so... Out, so out of the outbreak season, yes, we can take another sample and we can jolly well with the reagent and everything. But what I what I'm telling is right. Just actually, uh, I don't know. Uh, follow this patient and just get a blood sample after asking the what is the onset of rash and after day five you can take. So if the patient presentation is at, at least after day five, that is fine. But if the patient is presentation the same day with the rash, so it is useless. Definitely, it will be negative. Got it? Thank you so much. That's a very clear advice. Right. Uh, can I ask a question? I don't know whether you can answer this. Do you know, uh, do you have a, um, any idea of the clinical scenario uh, about the patient, whether they were just mild fever rash or whether they were in the ICU? Do you have any idea? Yes, sir. Um, so some most of the patients, are, as far as I know, because we are also following up few, right? So they are mild fever rash. And because actually sometimes rash is kind of a uh, huge, they have admitted to the OPDs. But other than that, actually not majority of cases are mild. That's what I understood. I think the clinicians can answer that question well. Thank you very much, Dr. Janaki Abhinayaka. That was a very clear presentation. I think we have to thank you for that. That's a very clear presentation. Thank you very much. The next speaker 
is Dr. Manjula Karyavasan. Can you please come to the podium? Uh, he is consultant epidemiologist, epidemiology unit, Ministry of Health. Uh, he is going to speak on global and local situation of measles and prevention. Thank you, Madam, for your kind introduction. So, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I appreciate the SLMA to uh, organize this timely topic and uh, inviting the epidemiology unit to participate for this symposium. So, um, this is my presentation outline. So, uh, as Dr. Janaki also uh, mentioned these things, I just to tell you for the uh, completeness of uh, the presentation. So, measles is an airborne disease caused by a virus and it is one of the most contagious disease in the world. So, the uh, infected person can uh, transmit this disease 16 to 18 susceptibles. So, that means the basic reproduction number for this uh, measles is 16 to 18, whereas for the COVID-19, this number is 4 to 5. So, um, and uh, uh, so danger of uh, contracting this measles is it is uh, lead to severe complications and death. In 2021, there were about estimated 128,000 deaths occurred globally, mostly among unvaccinated or partially vaccinated children, mainly among under five children. So. Uh, again, uh, the main modality of prevention is the vaccination. Measles is having a safe and effective vaccine, and also it is inexpensive compared with other vaccines. And um, uh, so, uh, so measles vaccination averted 56 million deaths since 2000 to 2021. And in 2022, about 83% of uh, world's children received at least one measles-containing vaccine uh, before their first birthday. So uh, we'll move on to the global measles situation. So you can uh, see here the measles case distribution by month according to the WHO regions from 2018 to 2023. So as you can see here in 2019, there's a uh, huge marked upsurge of cases uh, in all over the world, mainly affecting the African, uh, EMRO and uh, Southeast Asian region. And um, the caseload has uh, drastically reduced during the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic period, mainly due to uh, restrictions of the movements of the people for the COVID-19 control. And uh, after, uh, at the uh, beginning of the 2022, again, measles cases has increased uh, gradually. And uh, experts are uh, predicting that it can go exponentially high in the uh, near future if we have not uh, uh, vaccinating the susceptibles. So this... Uh, Global map shows the, where the outbreaks are, so mainly affecting the African region, Southeast Asian region, and also the EMRO region. So this graph shows the global measles coverage, measles containing vaccine one and measles vaccine containing measles vaccine two, and also the susceptibles. So you can see uh, in 2019, global missiles coverage has come to 86 percent. So that is the highest coverage achieved since 2008. So after that, with due to, due to COVID-19, it has drastically reduced the coverage up to 81 percent. So when we convert these percentages into absolute numbers, it is 25 million children are susceptible for this uh, deadly disease. So um, then uh, similarly 15%, 15 million children partially vaccinated uh, for this missiles containing vaccines as uh, children need to take two doses of missiles containing vaccine to uh, get their full protection. 
So this uh, uh, in in uh, 2021 and 2022, there is a uh, small increase of COVID, uh, measles containing vaccine 1 and measles containing vaccine 2 coverage, but still 22 million uh, children are susceptible for this uh, deadly disease. Moving to the Southeast Asian region uh, measles situation, here you can see the uh, countries affected and also the measles vaccine, measles containing vaccine one and two coverages from 2000 onwards. So uh, you can see uh, until up to 2019, there is a uh, considerable number of cases reported from uh, all the countries, uh, neighboring countries. Uh, again, due to COVID-19, with the restrictions of the COVID-19 uh, uh, control, it has gone down in 2020 and 2021, but in 2022 and 2023, in this year, there is a clear upsurge of cases and having a lot of outbreaks in and around the uh, in and around our country, uh, especially neighboring countries. So, uh, the cover when we consider about the coverage, missiles containing vaccine coverage, it has gone up to 94 percent. Very commendable coverage has achieved by the Southeast Asian region for last uh, few years, but unfortunately with this COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, it has again dropped uh, up to 86% uh, for the last uh, two years. Uh, however, fortunately it is now uh, uh, coming back to the uh, previous level gradually, but still uh, 9.1 9 million of cases people, uh, children are susceptible in 2020 and 2022. Similarly, 5.3 million children remain partially vaccinated for measles. So, uh, especially this uh, Myanmar, India and uh, Nepal are having a lot of outbreaks. Uh, currently, they are experiencing these outbreaks. So, those countries are very close to us, uh, as Dr. Janiki mentioned, and some strains also very uh, close to uh, uh, gene sequencing has uh, revealed that uh, one uh, uh, circulating strain is uh, very close to Indian Ahmedabad strain. So uh, moving to the local situation, so Sri Lanka has uh, maintained uh, more than 95% of coverage for all the childhood vaccination for last two decades. Uh, even though we had, uh, we very badly affect this COVID-19 and also with uh, due to some uh, uh, economic constraints, uh, our public health staff and also the curative health staff did their job very uh, commendably. They maintained this uh, vaccine vaccination coverage for all childhood vaccination. So uh, I'll try to uh, give you some uh, uh, current and past epidemiology of measles in Sri Lanka by uh, going through this slide. As you all can see, before the uh, pre-vaccination era, we had a lot of measles cases and uh, the burden is very high. So uh, Sri Lanka has introduced measles vaccine in 1984. And with that, there is a... Uh, uh, gradual reduction of uh, 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 drastic reduction of cases and maintain that uh, that level for another 15 years. But um, unfortunately we had experienced another outbreak of measles in uh, 1999 and 2000, year 2000 uh, mainly among adolescent uh, age groups uh, and uh, with that uh, the Ministry of Health has introduced the second measles containing vaccine, that is the measles rubella vaccine in 2001 on completion of three years. So after that, uh, 2003 and 2004, uh, Ministry of Health has conducted two main catch-up campaigns to 
cover the second dose of measles containing vaccines, those who have missed uh, after introducing the uh, measles containing vaccine. So that is among 10 to 15 years uh, and 16 to 20 years age group. So um, then uh, uh, from 1999 to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, from 2001 to uh, 2013, uh, sorry, before that, uh, in 2011, we have introduced MMR vaccine by replacing measles vaccine at the age of nine months. We introduced uh, the MMR vaccine on completion of one year and second dose of measles containing vaccine by replacing the MMR vaccine at the on completion of three years in 2011, October 1st. So with that, uh, from 2001 to 2013, we, we, we were able to maintain good control of measles uh, cases in the country. But again, in 2013, we had another outbreak, uh, mainly among six months old infants and uh, six months to 12 months old infants. So uh, with that, uh, with that, actually, we did a uh, supplementary immunization activity to counteract that um, outbreak among the six months old infants and 12 months old infants, irrespective of, of their vaccination status. We have given a, a single dose of measles vaccine in 2015. So the epidemiology unit has conducted a zero prevalence study in 2015 to, uh, and it has found that uh, among these uh, infants, the they are uh, zero prevalence level is very low and interestingly uh, it has found that uh, 15 to 16 year age group also having low uh, zero prevalence at that time uh, so these people are now in 20 to 30 years at the moment so with that uh, the uh, ministry of health has uh, decided to revert back this uh, mmr first dose at the, which was given at, on completion of one year, advance again back to the nine months. So um, with that, uh, so we have reported our last case of indigenous measles in 2016. So with that, the WHO has uh, certified the uh, Sri Lanka as the measles eliminated country. As uh, Dr. Janike mentioned, in 2019 and 2018, we had a small outbreak among uh, uh, especially medical community, especially medical students and nursing students, which had very clear link to the Myanmar. So it has uh, uh, controlled by uh, doing uh, vaccination at that time. And uh, unfortunately, since uh, May 2023, and that means uh, last May, we reported the uh, this uh, current outbreak, which is uh, mainly among uh, vaccine, uh, unvaccinated minority, those who are refusing the vaccines. So um, this table shows the uh, 2021, how many uh, infants and also children are refused, I mean, uh, not taken their vaccines due to their refusal of vaccines. So um, actually, this uh, vaccine refusal has uh, uh, refusal uh, has started in the latter part of 2011, and it has gradually increased. So we are aware of that, and we instructed our medical officer of health and their staff to maintain a hesitant register at each and every MOH office and try to convince these people to get these vaccines time to time. So they maintain this register. From there, we got this information. So you can see here. In uh, MMR1, there are about 1,352 uh, kids were eligible, but they have not taken the vaccine. And uh, for this MMR2, 2,200 uh, infants are, uh, children, are, uh, children are eligible, but they have not taken the vaccine due to the refusal. So, um, so we uh, reported this National Hospital of Sri Lanka has reported the first case of this outbreak, 23-year-old uh, male from Kalambutan. Uh, we reported this case on 23rd of uh, May uh, through our routine surveillance, and he was tested positive after sending the samples to the uh, 
Medical Research Institute. And uh, so uh, Medical Research Institute has sent this sample to the um, gene sequencing and it was found that it is related to uh, Australia, uh, Victoria, Australia strain. And this per particular person has not taken any measles containing vaccine. So um, uh, as previously uh, asked the number of cases reported, so far actually 350 cases have been reported to the epidemiology unit, out of which we have completed 321 field investigation and we are having 321 uh, uh, full details. So uh, those details I am going to present here. So this is the epic curve. So uh, as uh, this uh, outbreak has started in 23rd of May, uh, it has gradually increased and two to four cases, but uh, uh, in during this uh, June, July and August, it has gone up to, uh, uh, baseline has gone up to five to six cases, and some days uh, even 10 to uh, 11 cases ha have been reported. So these are the uh, uh, districts reported uh, these uh, confirmed measles cases. Uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, Colombo has reported the highest number of cases. It is uh, nearly 50%, 49%, 157 cases. And followed by Jaffna district, it is 16.8%, cases, 16.8% and 54 cases. And followed by uh, Gampaha and Kalutara. And other districts also uh, reported few cases. And uh, Goal has reported 10 cases, Matara 8 cases. Likewise, uh, we are having uh, all details for 321 cases as of uh, last uh, uh, end of August. So this, I'm going to just show you this slide uh, because this is, this is, this three layers shows, first layer shows the hesitant for MMR1 in 2022. And uh, the uh, second layer shows the hesitancy for MMR2. Uh, and third layer is the measles cases reported until up to the end of the August. So you can see some similarities, especially in uh, Colombo and uh, Colombo Municipal Council area. So, uh, and, and other places also very much a similar picture uh, for the uh, hesitant groups uh, where this outbreak is uh, circulating. So um, when we consider about the race of these uh, uh, positive measles cases, 136 cases, that means 42% among Moors and 34% among Sinhalese and 22, nearly 23% among Tamil, uh, Tamils in this uh, out of 321 cases. So this is again, I think it's uh, one of the most important slide here. Um, this is the uh, distribution of cases by age categories. So less than nine months, nearly 18%, I mean more than 18% cases among nine months old, uh, less than nine months uh, old babies, those who are not eligible for measles containing vaccine. So actually most of the cases g uh, get this infection from their siblings. Siblings and uh, hesitant families circulating this virus among the family members. And unfortunately, those who are not eligible for this vaccine are getting uh, contact this uh, deadly viral disease. Um, other than that, other uh, uh, non-hesitant family members also getting affected uh, due to various reasons. Some got this infection during their hospital stay. Likewise, they also get affected for this uh, disease. So nine months to three years, Again, nearly 18%, 57 cases among the nine months to three years. And three to 15 years, again, 18% uh, get affected. And interestingly, 20 to 30, 30 years, again, nearly 29%. As I mentioned earlier, uh, in 20 to 30 year age group has, uh, uh, earlier in 2015, zero prevalence study has shown that there's a dip in their zero conversion. So um, uh, consider about this un uh, vaccination status. You can see uh, majority, nearly 60% is not vaccinated for any, any uh, measles containing vaccine. And a single dose has taken 37% uh, at 118 cases. And uh, unfortunately, 11 cases, we found that they have taken both 
measles containing vaccines uh, though they have uh, get this disease i think uh, i don't want to uh, go in detail about this slide this, this is the gene sequencing results uh, as dr janaki very clearly mentioned it is very uh, connected to australia uh, victoria strain and uh, india ahmedabad strain and uh, this is the response to the current measles outbreak uh, so um, so as uh, dr janik also mentioned we are having very strong uh, uh, disease surveillance system so all the fever rash cases should inform to the epidemiology unit and the respective medical officer of health for all suspected measles patients so we are sending both uh, serum and throat swab uh, as mentioned earlier so we are, we are supposed to send both uh, throat swabs and the blood samples uh, as we have already eliminated the disease according to the who uh, criteria and uh, all contacts of the confirmed cases are followed up for two incubation period that means nearly 28 days uh, the our field staff is following up these uh, cases just to see uh, early detecting other cases and, uh, and and complications as well so uh, for to response for these uh, confirmed cases for each case we have to uh, the public health staff or field health staff has to screen 50, 30 to 50 household or within 1 km radius screen for any clinically suspected cases of measles measles or rubella whatever and uh, then occupants should screen for their vaccination status if unvaccinated person are found the following steps the the table has given here so following steps should be followed so if the uh, child is between 9 months to 3 years without any vaccination so you have to immediately give the uh, mmr one dose and the second dose should be given after completion of 3 years so if if the if you found any child with 3 uh, years to 15 years without any measles containing vaccine you have to immediately give the first dose and the second dose should be followed by another 8 weeks so any contacts in the same household between 15 to 45 contacts in the same household between 15 to 45 years if they have not uh, taken any measles containing vaccine yes they they can uh, take another mmr vaccine so uh, we have done uh, so many awareness uh, programs uh, on this so we communicated with the college of pediatricians and college of general practitioners and uh, we did uh, uh, we circulate all the circulars among the curative and public health uh, staff and uh, uh, we circulate the uh, measles um, uh, outbreak response guidelines with the all the uh, health staff health staff including the private health uh, private hospitals and uh, we had a meeting with all silon uh, jamaitul ulama association and it was uh, actually it was uh, very successful and um, then uh, we uh, conduct frequent meetings with our public health staff especially the district health staff and sometimes we we are contacting the uh, mo uh, staff for uh, control this outbreak uh, according to the uh, requirement and um, uh, so we are uh, we request them to maintain the uh, uh, i mean list of missed children and try to uh, convince them again and uh, uh, try to vaccinate this unvaccinated children and we are having very good response with uh, all the uh, other uh, religious leaders and other leaders all, all already given their commitment and now uh, we are getting uh slowly but uh, people are now coming for the vaccine re is regional epidemiologists and consultant community physicians were advised to conduct meetings with religious leaders actually they have already conducted most of the places especially kolonnava gothru area and even in other kalambu dehiwala area they did a uh, lot of and even uh, in kalmuna area they did a uh, lot of awareness campaigns with these uh, religious leaders and um, Uh, we initiated initiated the vaccination of these uh, health staff 
uh, in uh, IDH, Infectious Disease Hospital, and uh, LRH Hospital. And also, uh, we have already vaccinated the uh, Ratnapura Hospital and uh, Polonnaruwa Hospital. And uh, we are planning to vaccinate uh, another private hospital as well. So, um, uh, we are very closely linked with the uh, WHO country office and uh, WHO Southeast Asia uh, regional office for uh, controlling the, this outbreak. We had uh, about two weeks back uh, Southeast Asian region uh, uh, immunization technical advisory group uh, meeting was there. So we presented this and they were quite uh, happy about the uh, control activities we are uh, currently adhering to. And uh, that is the end of my presentation. These are the uh, actions we have taken from the center and also the uh, field health staff. Uh, to awareness, uh, awareness and door-to-door uh, uh, -door, uh, campaigns. And thank you for your kind attention. Uh, I'm very proud to present Dr. BJC Pereira. I think he's the best person to speak on this. In 2011, you said that 2011 MMR vaccine was introduced. At that time, he predicted what's going to happen to the measles, the, because the, it was earlier at nine months, measles vaccine, and when it was postponed to one year, he predicted it's going to affect the children. And it happened in 2013, what he predicted. And he was a fighter, sort of, I can remember very well, at all SLCP meetings, he was uh, quite a fighter. He made a row on that. Dr. B.J. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at the outset, thank you very much uh, for those kind words. And also, I'm grateful to the Expert Committee on Communicable Diseases for asking me to talk to you today. Um, some of the information in my slides, I think, have already been uh, given by the virologist and the epidemiologist. So I do apologize if I have to repeat some of that again. Uh, but then some of that information is worth repeating over and over again because it has got uh, sig tra a tremendous uh, significance as far as uh, control of the disease is concerned. Measles, is it a thing of the past? That's what we thought from 2019 onwards. It was at least until this year. Not now, not quite, not by a long shot. And whatever we do from previous experience of the clinicians, that when there is an outbreak, it's not easy to control it. It might even take more than a year to control it, whatever we do. Because that, is, that has been our exper experience in some of the outbreaks that we have seen in the past. It became a thing of the past due to vaccination. Because vaccines don't save patients or save lives, vaccination does. And now it's raising its ugly head due to vaccine hesitancy. That is, the vaccines are there, but vaccination is not there. Um, I have seen, as a medical student in the late 1960s, before many of you were born, I think, um, and a junior and middle grade doctor in the 1970s, as well as a consultant in the early 1980s, I saw loads and loads of measles. I have given the other two names by which it is known, rubiola and mobili as well. It had very high morbidity and quite significant mortality. Measles is now seen, actually, as you saw uh, uh, from Dr. Kariwasam's uh, slides, that it is seen mainly in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and a few countries in the West as well. Uh, it is endemic with outbreaks in some Asian and African countries. Uh, in developing countries like Africa and Asia, it is due to a lack of vaccines and vaccine hesitancy, both, because they don't have the money, some of those countries, to buy the vaccine. 
In the developed countries in the West and the Middle East, it is purely due to vaccine hesitancy and not due to a lack of the vaccine. Measles is an airborne, highly infectious viral disease. You have heard this before. But what is not very commonly uh, realized is that if you have one case of measles to which 10 non-immune contacts are exposed for one minute, nine will get it. It's that infectious. Nine out of 10 people. Even for one minute. It's a serious problem that can lead to complications and death. Here are the things that uh, can go wrong once you get measles. The problem is that for a very long time, uh, measles was considered to be part of childhood. Uh, it was also known as a the young lady type of thing uh, earlier, that it is something that the gods give uh, in the course of childhood. But you can get keratitis and blindness, especially with vitamin A deficiency, uh, severe diarrhea. And we did see uh, children being brought in very late after that because they wouldn't want to come to the hospitals at that time because of the measles. The measles was considered part, of, part and parcel of life, really. Ear infections can lead to even deafness and major lower respiratory tract infections and pneumonia leading to death. This, this was the thing that was killing most of the children at that time. In fact, as a medical student, I hated pediatrics um, because I couldn't stomach the fact that every morning at LRH, a couple of um, dead bodies were wheeled out who had died during the day, during the night. Um, that they were not all due to measles, but then the deaths were very high. It's not the case anymore. And viral encephalitis leading to brain damage and subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis, which is a slow virus infection. I'll talk a little bit about it uh, later. And the incidence of uh, SSP is 6.5 to 11 per 100,000. It's pretty rare, actually. The world, you have, you have seen this, uh, this, uh, these results between 2020-2021. Vaccination averted 56 million measles deaths globally, according to the World Health Organization. And in 2019, measles caused 207,000 deaths in the world. In 2022, 83% of children in the world received at least one dose of measles vaccine before the first birthday. Now, people are very complacent about this value of 83%. Just not good enough because this disease is so infective that unless you reach very close to 100% coverage, that you cannot control it. Herd immunity is very difficult to establish in, in measles. So the, there is no real herd immunity as such. As the virus is extremely transmissible from person to person, a very high level of population immunity, where, as I said, with two doses and as close to 100% as possible, is required for significant protection. <clears throat> Vaccine hesitancy would scuttle this and kill the children. Clinical features of measles. Incubation period has now been revised, really, because it used to be said it's between 7 to 21 days. Because of the infectivity of the viruses and the strains that one sees now, uh, from the clinical point of view, that it has been revised to 10 to 14 days. And this is very important because if you have contacts, uh, that when you deal with them clinically, that this number of days becomes quite important. And it's followed by high swinging fever, coryza, cough, and conjunctival injection with generalized signs of toxicity and feeling ill. I mean, these children really look very ill, or, or not always, but then when they do get a CP attack, depending on their immune status. Uh, the characteristic coplic spots appear by the second or third day. We have seen loads of it, but I don't think the current uh, batch of medical students and the younger doctors have ever seen coplic spots. 
and they appear by the second or third day and they are white spots on a red base in the buccal mucosa, especially around the upper molar uh, areas. Described by Henry Koplik, a New York pediatrician, in as far back as 1896. And the erythematous maculopapular and confluent skin rash. It is important to notice that it, is, it can be confluent also. That the whole thing sort of joins up together, the, the different uh, areas of the rash, and appears by the fourth day. Uh, and later, you get what was called post measles staining. It leaves a bit of a stain, a kind of dark staining. It may not be that obvious in dark skinned people, but it is still there. And acute compli complications may develop from the fifth day onwards. Now here is a fairly typical uh, sort of uh, image of how uh, this thing progresses. Uh, you can see you can see that how it starts from here and then goes up for roughly about four days, maximum five days, and then it starts to come down. But you can see the, the conjunctivitis, coriza, cough starting very early, the, virtually within a day of the development of the disease, and then coplic spots come on somewhere around the third day, and the rash comes usually around the fourth day. So that is how it progresses. Now, these are some images of uh, the rash that you get. These are from very severely affected children, really. Um, and you can see the conjunctival suffusion, uh, the coplic spots at the bottom with the, with the, with the arrow. Uh, and uh, it affects the palms and soles. There aren't very many rashes that affect the palms and soles. Uh, because some of the others are like... Um, uh, recursive diseases, they do, and it's a kind of uh, a diagnostic feature that is used. And uh, the acute killer complications are diarrhea, acute encephalopathies, encephalitis really. Sorry, I shouldn't call it an encephalopathy. I'll tell you why later. Uh, acute respiratory infections. These are things a lot of children used to die. And there are two types of acute respiratory infections. One may be by the virus itself. And then it's all hell breaks loose. Very difficult to control it. The second is because uh, measles is well known to change the immune status, even in the acute phase. And therefore, you, they are very much more susceptible to get bacterial infections. Again, pretty difficult to control because of the reduction in the immunity. Uh, on the 21st of March, 1963, the first live virus measles vaccine was licensed in the United States and uh, released for public usage. Measles was endemic in Sri Lanka up to about the late 1980s with heavy outbreaks on and off. And the measles vaccination started in, as you heard before, August 1984. And uh, the, these are two of the studies that uh, we have been involved in. That first was the impact of accelerated immunization program in Ratnapura. I was working in Ratnapura at that time, uh, where we showed that before and after uh, incidence of the disease. It was very convincing. Within a very short time of uh, 1984, away from 1984, within two years, that the number of cases had gone way down, whereas we used to see a lot of cases before that. Then the problem is, now the second paper, because later on, uh, sometime in 1991, or a little before that the uh, study was done, uh, we reported in 1991, still it was... Uh, a, a cause for childhood morbidity. That is because the catch-up of the vaccine 
was not going to the level that we really needed to get adequate control. So it was still there, even in the 1990s. Uh, it was slow to catch up right up to the 1990s. Major outbreaks uh, with many deaths in 1999 and 2000 and 2013. Uh, 2013, and that was the MMR first dose being shifted to the first year. Uh, I think Kalyani mentioned that. Um, <laughs> uh, um, that was done, unfortunately, without proper consultations, especially with the clinicians. Uh, because we would have probably given reasons why it should not be done uh, very convincingly at that time. I'll tell you that in a moment. Uh, Sri Lanka was, as you heard, declared measles-free by the World Health Organization in 2019. Now, there is a resurgence, as you have heard so much up to now. The current measles outbreak in Sri Lanka due almost entirely to vaccine hesitancy, as you heard. There are some subtle differences in this outbreak, clinically. Uh, quite a number of under one year olds, and um, again, I'll deal with this a bit later, variable heights of fever, then rash could come a little earlier in some patients, around the third day or so, but in others, it has been delayed quite a lot. Few, I mean, these are not very many, these are few, through seven to eight days, especially in the immunocompromised. And just a few got it even after natural measles, mostly adults, or after one vaccine dose. Complications are about the same. Only some have post-measles staining. Quite a few adults are affected, as you, as you saw from the figures uh, presented by uh, Dr. Karevism. Um, now, up to that point, none of the affected children, children have had two doses of the vaccine. I don't know whether this position has changed now, whether there have been any cases that Dr. Karevism would be able to tell us in a moment. The vast majority of those affected have not had any doses of the vaccine, which you saw with the, with the, uh, with the figures. Now, infants under 12 months are particularly important. But what is not realized is that they are the age group in whom most of the complications occur. And the SSP incidence is much higher, double the risk, basically, mm -hmm. because it's one in 5,500. The earlier figure that I quoted was about 1 in 10,000 or so. So in the first year of life, it can be quite dangerous and quite susceptible due to very low or undetectable antibody levels after six months of age. Now it's even lower, I think, as we see it. And the reason is that this immunity is due to transfer of antibodies through the placenta. Mother's immunity, it depends on whether it's due to natural infection or to vaccination. And today's mothers, all, almost all, are this, they're vaccinated. They haven't had measles. And there's pretty good evidence all over the world, uh, from a clinical point of view, that uh, the amount of, uh, uh, amount of protection or the antibodies that are produced by vaccination in going on with the age, on to the age, it tends to wane uh, quite a lot uh, and compared to natural disease. Therefore, the original decision to give the first dose at nine months was based on two uh, principles. One is that if you give it earlier and there are a lot of antibodies in the baby, that it will neutralize the uh, virus because it's uh, it's attenuated virus that you are using by passing it uh, or passage as they call it uh, 40 times through uh, the uh, the uh, through animals and. Uh, 
but this again does not uh, seem to occur now because there are studies where antibody levels in babies uh, in in the west especially uh, because almost all the girls are um, uh, the young girls and young women are immunized against measles that their antibody le levels are almost undetectable by 6 months so that is the reason that this disease produ which produces so much of complications in the under under one year child is also much more um, likely to cause the disease in that same age group and in some countries the mmr is given at 6 months now especially when the baby is due to travel to areas with a high prevalence of measles mm -hmm. and canada is one country which does that um treatment of meals no antiviral drug that is effective over the years nothing has changed standard non specific treatment watch out for the complications so the complications are respiratory infections can be upper and lower tracts including acute suppurative otitis media uh, which i said that it can be due to the virus itself or due to secondary bacterial infection and brain involvement <coughs> now there is primary measles and encephalitis in the first week of the illness one in about 1000 the pretty high mortality about 10 to 15% that's the first one this is actually due to invasion by the virus then you have a post infectious measles and encephalitis it's a kind of a autoimmune mechanism or direct invasion by the virus people are not quite sure and the mortality is about 20% then there is a third type called measles inclusion body encephalitis subacute measles encephalitis that's another terminology that is used especially in those with impaired immunity it is progressive and there is a very high mortality especially when it is combi combined with impaired immunity it's about 75% and then you have subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis chronic demyelination it's the all the symptoms are due to chronic demyelination and the mortality is 95% and in 5% you tend to get uh, a spontaneous remission but after what period of time we don't know and how much of Re residual brain damage is uh, is there in that 5% it's very difficult to say <coughs> now vitamin a deficiency increases the mortality it affects the severity of measles delays recovery can lead to measles related complications including blindness and is associated with a higher rate of deaths so that the treatment uh, protocol now of measles includes vitamin a and rather large doses actually uh, that uh, that are being used now a word about subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis uh, it's caused by a slow virus infection by measles the virus staying dormant in humans for extended periods of time then for reasons yet unknown um, getting um, reactivated in the brain then manifestations are seen 8 to 11 years after measles so most of those problems are generally seen by the adult physicians and the time that we were students we saw whole loads of cases of ssp uh, in the adult uh, wards especially uh, neurology wards and neurology wards were what uh, dr george ratnavel was the only neurologist at uh, colombo uh, general hospital at that time um and he used to make this diagnosis you know just by looking at the 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 patient because he was so familiar with it so initially the visual symptoms sometimes precede the development of the real brain damage by about 2 years so that might be the things that start first the classic lesion being focal necrotizing macular retinitis so it will interfere with the vision you can get retinal hemorrhages papilledema and blindness as well now progressive cognitive uh, cognitive uh, decline is the one that is seen almost 100% in 
initially personality changes or behavior changes followed by poor school performance and intellectual deterioration so very slowly these children get this disease that that would progress right through over years and steady deterioration in motor functions comes next with myoclonus autonomic dysfunction and focal paralysis some have either focal or generalized seizures and the patients eventually fall into a vegetative state or a kinetic mutism uh, which is shortly followed by death as i said before 95% mortality so even if you get one case of subacute uh, pan encephalitis sclerosing subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis is one too many because when you make that diagnosis it's like you are writing a death certificate there is no treatment for this at the present time absolutely nothing that you can do um there are a couple of unusual cases i will show which will be of interest uh, one is uh, a, a person in late middle aged male has had measles infection as a child life so you would expect lifelong immunity in this person but now that person has developed multiple myeloma and is being treated with immunosuppressive drugs so he got measles around the 18th of august uh, this year was quite ill with a very severe attack exertional dyspnea for no real reasons without a cough or evidence of a uh, of a, uh, a really bad chest infection and with uh, you know when that person just walked around a little bit there was oxygen desaturation on a uh, pulse oximeter and uh, the ct scan showed what is called cellular bronchiolitis there are different types of bronchiolitis that you get uh, segmental all kinds of things are uh, described by the radiologist he has fortunately recovered well with intensive treatment and usual case number 2 is a adult lady doctor has had two doses of vaccine as a child and i can vouch for that because she has been my patient long years ago and this is the vaccination card what's written in red is all mine uh so uh she got measles around the latter part of august uh recovered well and quite healthy before and after as well and not on any immunosuppression so um the these i think type of cases i think dr karosam described this there are few who would get this is probably due to waning of immunity this is this, this can happen and it depends on the constitution of each individual we we have no way of predicting this so that now the outbreak that is there that is why i said that it will take a long time that there is no protection even among some of the adults uh they i have highlighted i have actually given the first measles dose that is the pure measles vaccine at that time because it was 1992 um uh, and uh, that was uh, at eight and a half months of age because i think the child was brought around that time from uh, from uh, for vaccination and then the second one was the mmr vaccine given in the year 2000 quite late actually but then you would expect that it to uh, have the real effect of uh, um, immune uh, sort of enhancement by giving the vaccine even later on so that was quite a delay to not given at 3 years of age so the possibilities are was it a ineffective vaccine in the first place uh was it due to waning of immunity or is it due to extra virulent virus we don't really know the answer some random musings to uh, finish off acute attacks of measles are known to induce long term remissions in 
idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. So it does have some effect on the immunity of a person as a disease itself. <coughs> this was uh, well documented and we saw this over and over again when measles was rampant. So in fact, it was at that stage, uh, it was almost thought of uh, to, if there was a child with measles, to put that child with the nephrotic syndrome child in perhaps the same room um, to get uh, the nephrotic syndrome under control. Unorthodox kind of treatment, but uh, it was done. Measles virus vaccine strain infections, that is the Edmonton Zagreb strain, and the measles vaccine itself have shown some effect in very aggressive Burkitt lymphoma. This is pretty recent work, actually. Uh, at least one case uh, of that gr uh, cohort was Burkitt lymphoma, which are not responding to anything, not responding to any of the uh, anti-cancer uh, drugs. But the moment this was used, that, that patient improved. And uh, they are now using uh, extra potent measles vaccine. That is by not passaging through 40 times, but less, 10 to 20 times, still to attenuate the virus, um, being tested as a treatment for multiple myeloma. So that person with multiple myeloma who got measles, they're hoping that it would control his m multiple myeloma as well. I don't know. I mean, this is only, uh, only just speculation. Significant success has been reported by the Mayo Clinic uh, in the use of extrapotent measles vaccine in multiple myeloma. So that's just the starting point for that. Finally, a parting shot. This is me. Birth weight of 800 grams. At that time, I think uh, nobody of that uh, birth weight s ever survived. And I was not kept in a hospital. I was uh, managed at home uh, by my devoted parents. Uh, and at the time that I couldn't suck, as I was taken home within a few days of birth, practically to die at home, uh, they put a wick on my mouth, my mother used to say, and she squeezed the breast milk onto the one end of the wick. Somehow it seems to have got into my stomach anyway. The second, I have had measles and cephalopathy at around five years of age. Um, and I have been either semi-conscious or unconscious for about three weeks, once again managed at home. So there is reasonable evidence to suspect a fair amount of brain damage from both these instances. So ladies and gentlemen, it's time for me to take my leave. And as this beautiful young lady would say, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. B.J. Sipir.